will now start with this workshop. Please give it up and start clapping for Kunal Kamra. Hello. Hello. That's enough claps. Welcome to the workshop. This is a comedy writing workshop and this is a stand-up comedy workshop. And that's what it is. It's all I know about stand-up comedy. We're going to do topics that I feel are important for you to be a stand-up comedian in the future. Uh, we start with important topics uh, that you may have to go through, may have to inquire a little further than me also, because you should know more about stand-up than me eventually. That's the plan, right? So we'll start with the simple topics. The simple topics of stand-up are what is a premise and what is a punchline? A premise is something that is set up. A punchline is something that is delivered. How we'll proceed through this is I'll play a video of someone I think is nailing this, the premise and punchline. We'll see the video. We'll ask questions towards the comedian and his craft. And we'll try and answer it together. We have eight tables and six mics. And just let's pass the mic around whenever someone needs it. And let's start with watching your first comedian, who's one of my favorite comedians when it comes to setup and punchline. I think very few do it better than him. Let's start with Mitch Hedberg. I was walking by a dry cleaner at 3 AM, and the sign said, sorry, we're closed. You don't have to be sorry. It's 3 a.m. and you're a dry cleaner. <laughs> it would be ridiculous for me to expect you to be open. <laughs> I'm not gonna walk in at 10 and say, hey man, I walked by at three, you guys were closed. Somebody owes me an apology. <laughs> I've been working, hey, that's right. I had a apartment in Los Angeles and I had a neighbor and whenever he would knock on my wall I knew he wanted me to turn my music down and that made me angry because I like loud music so when he knocked on the wall I'd mess with his head I'd say go around <laughs> I cannot open the wall I don't know if you have a doorknob on the other side but over here there's nothing a commercial on late night TV it said forget everything you know about slip covers so I did <laughs> and it was a load off my mind <laughs> then the commercial tried to sell slip covers but I didn't know what the hell they were <laughs> I like to take a toothpick and throw it in the forest and say you're home <laughs> I get up in the morning I make myself a bowl of instant oatmeal and then I don't do anything for an hour which makes me wonder why I need the instant oatmeal. <laughs> I could get the regular oatmeal and feel productive. Yeah, that's, that's Mitch Hedberg for us. Okay, what do we learn from Mitch Hedberg? What did I learn from Mitch Hedberg? The economy of words. Mitch Hedberg's any joke will never have a word that's unnecessary. Every joke will have every word that is necessary. I crossed the dry cleaner at 3 a.m. They had a sign, we are sorry we're closed. It's fine, you're a dry cleaner. It's not like I'm gonna come 10 a.m. next day and demand an apology. Be like, I was here at three, you were closed. I can't do that joke without the number of words that are used. And for a comedian who's of different type, he's a one-liner comedian. He sets up a premise that you can relate to. Throwing a toothpick in a forest and saying, I'm home. You can relate to the toothpick made out of wood and the forest. And the words used are so minimal. Just to complete the joke. He's a one-liner comedian. He just jokes in setting up the joke and just delivering a punchline. All his punchlines are unique because you are not laughing at relatability. You are laughing at the bizarreness of the punchline. You are laughing not because you thought of it. You're laughing because you could have never thought of it that way. And that is, for me, Mitch Hedberg's genius. That he takes something relatable and makes it so bizarre that it is very difficult to not laugh. A joke of his, which is one of my favorite, and it's in the least number of words any joke is, I feel. A dog is 
always in push up position seven words do that joke eliminating even one word it won't work mitch hedberg was a one liner comedian he did all the comedy festivals he tried a few sitcoms he was in a few movies died really young uh but he was one of the few one liner comedians and nobody till date has been able to spot a better one liner comedian let's discuss mitch hedberg what are your questions who wants to go first this only works if we interact with each other <laughs> otherwise it will just be us watching bunch of other comedians <laughs> which you all could have done at home <laughs> ask me the link i would have sent you all <laughs> the point is to discuss the comedian point is to discuss his craft so what do you all think what are your questions towards this form of comedy this way of setting up something and giving a punch line yeah my question is that uh, given that mitch hedberg is that a comical with words uh, does establishing a character help in yeah. being more comical with words so i think one liner comic in itself it's a character he is a certain way that's why he thinks in those lines and that's why he thinks in such a bizarre way if you see he's performing sometimes with his eyes closed looking down not facing the audience at all not interacting with them at all because that's how sure he is of his writing he doesn't have to do anything mitch hedberg doesn't even move an inch throughout 40 minutes of his set 45 minutes of his set and sometimes it's worked sometimes it's not worked but mitch hedberg has not changed himself because he is already a character so that is what works for him how do you manage to keep up that energy even if it's for an hour and even if you manage to do that in how do you get the audience to mirror your energy for an hour see i think the audience is nothing but a mirror of what they see so if you are energetic for an hour the audience will show the same energy and you can see this across performances if you are happy they are happy with you if you are sad they are sad with you if you are nervous they are more nervous for you so that energy also travels everything that is here will travel to them so if he is doing the set for let's say 40 minutes and yeah. he's doing the same premise punchline premise punchline thing right. he doesn't have a high or a low it, how does he keep the audience hooked for so long i think by the 18th or 19th minute the audience is already in a state of flow because he has generated them into thinking and understanding uh, you know comedy that he does and it only gets better for him so like other comedians they must have to start strong end strong mitch hedberg's jokes are designed in a certain way where he can start with the joke that he ends with and he can end with the joke that he starts with he does not really follow a certain pattern or a structure he's just written a bunch of one liner jokes and he just does them one after the other i i don't know whether we know about his journey or his history but uh, one liner comics like mitch hedberg or others <laughs> how do they discover that they want to be one liner comics do they try all forms of comedy and then zero in on it it's an interesting question because most people who start comedy and do their first open mic they don't go into their personality at all they just go with a bunch of jokes and most of them are one liners and it works for the first few time sometimes it doesn't work then they start discovering themselves and then they start adding a little bit of character to their jokes to their premise a little bit of more relatability to getting themselves on stage but everybody i know has started with one line of co comedy including myself like you just write a bunch of jokes you think they will work they are mostly one liners then you realize that you can do something more and you figure out your journey accordingly how do you come up with topics how do you identify that this is what i'm going to make jokes on or does it In instinctively come or i think the power of observation is something that is every joke is a unique perspective on a mundane thing so if you are observing something which everyone else has observed but you have a unique perspective on it that becomes a joke so what was one of the one liner jokes that you remember of yours now 
a one line of joke that i remember of mine was uh, most guys uh, when they go out on a date they carry a condom in their wallet uh, i carry oregano and chili flakes uh, there's a better chance of me using that that was one of my one line of jokes which has probably one of the first jokes i wrote in 2013 and i never released it because then you start building on a different style of comedy and then you start looking at comedy a little differently i just wanted to uh, ask if does it always have to be bizarre for it to be funny or do you know where it's you know more relatable for it to be funny in one line we, comedy we'll get there i think one line comedy uh, relatable works when they relate with the character of the person that's relatable like uh, somebody talking about their time at a college hostel that's relatable one line a comedy is you relating with the premise itself not with the person or the character he is not going there at all you know nothing about mitch hedberg you may see 50 minutes of his comedy you will know nothing about him that's how he likes it and uh, that's how he wants to roll but relatability and one line comedy i've never seen that marriage because relatability gets you a nod the character that you are relating with gets you the laugh one line a comedy you it's the v format as we all have seen as we all know that is the format we when it comes to relatability it's i was in a boys hostel i was in an engineering college i went to london i that's a whole different ball game again you are relating with people the joke may be delivered in a simple line but they are laughing with the character that has built that premise so let's go watch another comedian so that we can take this discussion forward nice to be here how are you doing good good good, good. nice to be here i uh, i'm broke anybody else broke <laughs> You ever get so broke that the bank starts charging you money for not having enough money? That's fucking broke, man. Bank called me up. They're like, "Hi, we're calling because you don't have enough money." I'm like, "I know." She's like, "Sir, you have insufficient funds." Well, that's a good way to put it too. I agree with that. I find my funds to be grossly insufficient. Thanks for calling. <laughs> why are you mad at me? I don't understand what How is this something I'm doing to you? She's like, "Sir, you only have $20. That's not enough. You can't only have $20." I'm like, "Look, I'm not being broke just to fuck with you. I just really don't have any money. I'm not trying to be a dick. I just my life is shitty." What? So they charged me. They charged me $15. That's how much it costs to only have $20. <laughs> But here's the fucked up part. Now I only have 5. <laughs> What did I pay the 20 to the $15 for if I don't get to have the $20 that I paid to have? I paid the fucking money. Where's my 20 bucks? <laughs> It's like going to the movies, you pay buy your ticket and they go get the fuck out of here. Go home. <laughs> But I paid for the movie. No, you paid for a ticket, motherfucker. You didn't pay for a movie. <laughs> you ever have negative money? That's depressing, isn't it? You look in your bank account, negative $10. That's how much I have now. Negative 10. <laughs> That means I don't even have no money now. I wish I did. I wish I didn't have anything. I wish I just had nothing, but I have less than that. I don't have none. I have not 10. I don't I can't I'm like if it's free, I can't fucking afford it. Somebody could come up to me, take this is free. Fuck, that costs nothing. I can't afford that. That's more than I have. I got to raise 10 bucks to be broke. That's where I'm at. That's not good. That's bad. Apparently some of you are in the same fucking position. <laughs> How's your economy doing? 
Shit. No, I'm glad you appreciate that story. Not everybody appreciates that story. I told that story about a week ago in Orange County, California, and all these rich motherfuckers looking at me with their boat tans and their golf shirts and penny loafers. They're all looking at me like, well, yeah. Like, you were financially irresponsible? You had to pay the price. I don't frankly see what you're angry about. The bank has a right to accrue a fee, clearly. That's how different it is to be rich than it is to be poor, because when you're rich, the bank pays you for being rich. If you have a lot of money, they give you money, because you have a lot of money. They say, you have so much money that we should give you some. Because you have a lot, you should have more. Here, take more money. Take this guy's 15, fuck him, you should have it. it makes perfect sense. He doesn't have enough, you have a lot. Fine, take it all, you motherfuckers. I don't give a shit. You ever get so broke it just becomes funny to you after a while? You're like, Jesus Christ! I have no fucking money! Jesus! People call you, hi, we're gonna turn off the... Yeah, fuck it! Turn it off, man! Turn it off! I don't give a shit! When can you make a payment? I ain't paying anything! What am I gonna fucking pay you with? I fucking sold the phone. I don't need it now. <laughs> Damn it, man. This shit's brutal. I live in New York, too, and man, there's, uh, you can't get along with no money in New York. You gotta live in these tiny places. I have this apartment, right? And uh, we have this... Okay, here's the toilet, right? I'm on the toilet. This is how small the apartment is. The, the top is right here, like right next to the toilet. Then there's a wall, like right fucking here. Like right... There's no... You gotta, you get squeezed in, and here's the worst part, I have to put a foot in the tub <laughs> to use this toilet, because otherwise I gotta go like this, who shits like this with their knees together? I'm pooping. Fucking dig in, on a fire. You gotta get into it. And in order to achieve, to achieve this position, I have to put a foot in the tub. Now try putting a foot in the tub when your pants are at your ankles. You can't. They both want to go, right? So I have to take off the whole pant leg, which means I have to take a shoe off every time I take a shit. Every time. And sometimes that's okay, but a lot of times it fucking isn't okay. <laughs> sometimes I didn't plan effectively, and I'm ten blocks from my house, and I've got to shit. You know when you you can't run because you'll bounce it out, so you got to kind of glide, and you're going, come on! God damn it! And you stop occasionally, fuck, fuck, fuck! Come on, man! God. Okay, I'm gonna make it. 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 And I always get to this point where, like, I'm gonna make it. I'm fucking fine. I'm fine. Mind over matter. I'm gonna make it. And then I see my house. I just see it. And my eyes tell the rest of me, fuck it, man. Let go. We're here. There's no need to hold on anymore. We've made it. Because my eyes are fucking retarded and they don't know the difference between the outside and the inside of my house. So now I got like Olympic seconds to fucking get in my house and open the door to the bathroom. And I gotta take a fucking shoe off? Are you? I have shit my pants 13 times. <laughs> I couldn't keep a straight face with that. All right. <laughs> oh, shut up. Ah, you better leave now. It doesn't get any better. Okay. Here we are. Louis C.K. 2004. Mobile recording. You can see people moving. Uh, of course, don't support what he did in his personal life. Uh, but as the student of comedy that I am, I don't think that I can finish uh, 
learning what I know about comedy without seeing Louis C.K. Uh, he does a bit about banks uh, where he tells you how banks treat a broke person. The premise is how banks treated him. The relatability is this is how every broke person is treated by the bank. Every punchline there is an interestingly put fact. So if he says, do you know the bank charges you money to not have enough money? That's a fact. But he has interestingly put it. And every punchline that he is giving has so much merit on its own. Like it is, I don't know, one of the best observational bits I have seen on the financial system. Uh, that we have in every country, universally relatable. So, I think it's a good bit to review, especially in while we are discussing premises and punchlines, because the premise and punchline both seem to be too much in sync with each other. So, any questions on his observations and the way he goes around with his comedy? Yeah. So, in his set, uh, he has used a callback. And uh, I have seen your set of Siachin yeah. and the video, I, it's very different. Yeah. So you are, I guess, one of the comedian who has used multiple callbacks with different premise. So how that idea came up with you? So it is, callback is basically, I think, uh, rem <laughs> the later it comes in a set, the more value it creates. So Louis C.K. once he thought that you will not think about him being broke with this $15. He got the $15, take this guy's 15 fuck him, who cares about him? That's what the callback is. It's getting the audience that information, the reputation of that joke in a more funny way, when it's least expected. So when I did my video, I must not use myself as an example, uh, but I used to spread out the callbacks throughout the hour but when I shot the video for YouTube, I edited it in such a way that I just used the set in the way it would work for YouTube. But if I was doing a live show, I would use that callback multiple times because then it would get the biggest response and use it at a time where it's least expected. Uh, and that's what he does. He uses it at a time it's least expected. You think he, he has spoken about him being broke, now he's going to rich people, then he tells you how rich people are using his broke money. So it's very interestingly stitched together. Yeah. Uh, There's a question on, on what you said right now, that the callbacks should be spread as far apart as, as possible. Uh, yeah. This may sound naive, but isn't that kind of uh, taxing for the audience? Because what if it's so far apart that they don't remember the callback has to have a stronger joke than what it had before. That is when it will work for sure. It is not working because you reference something that happened in the show before. You are referencing something that happened in the show before in the strongest possible manner. Like if you ask me the best joke of the set is take his 15 also, who cares about him, fuck him. So that callback is a very good standalone joke. Also, the premise of someone who already has money gets more money while someone is taken money from for just not having money. So he's done it in such an interesting way that that callback cannot fail. And if your callback joke is stronger than what you are calling back on, then it is more of a chance of it working. I think it's almost a hundred percent chance of the callback working with a live audience. Yeah. So you said earlier that the audience reflects on your energy and yeah. you know mirrors your energy and stuff. Yeah. And here both the comedians we saw kind of you know, like we saw the very different energy. Guy, very different energy. So is it does the energy depend on how fast you speak or how slow you speak? Because I I think that just depends on person to person, right? Some people have more of an impact if they speak faster, some people it's the opposite way. So what defines that energy on the on the stage? The the definition of energy on stage, like you saw Mitch Hedberg, I would beg to defer that he does not have energy. He has energy. He has a different kind of energy. Dave Attell has energy. He has a different kind of energy. And Louis C.K. has energy. He has a different kind of energy. But you have to see their energy or the aura they have is firstly supported with 
really amazingly written lines really very well refined jokes their characters playing a huge part in it and it's very close to who they are so that is the reason why it's working so that's what it is in comedy the whole goal is finding your voice and it takes as i said we saw mitch hedberg who was doing comedy for a long time then this bit of louis ck which is around 16 years old dave attell has been at there at a long time so their energy is basically who they are so they don't have to put on an energy and go to stage or take off the energy when they come out of stage it's basically who they are so uh, in this bit i think the underlying emotion uh, was like anger towards like first the being broke second or not having enough space and yeah. having to take off shoes so what if there's some topic about where it's just like neutral i mean you don't have any sort of view ha uh, emotion towards it because if when you have emotion it's easier to come up with something you know? yeah uh, yeah but what if it's something very neutral how how do you how do you like uh, approach that so this is a time in his life where he was actually very broke and you are right he is very emotional about it he is angry about it and how the system works and you can see that very well crafted in a bit the question is how do you write about something that you are not emotional angry invested in i think it is very easy to write about it but it is very difficult to do stand up about it because you have to convince the audience that you are present you are motivated about what you are speaking and you believe on these words so i think there are comics who have a world view like ck has a world view uh, mitch hedberg maybe not a world view but he has a view of how he should do stand up so i think whatever you are speaking if there is some emotion that is backing it it will sail much further than you being something very neutral about like if you go to an audience and say i hate shopping malls here are three jokes about that and then after that you say but you know here are three jokes about me liking the shopping mall also it will not work it would be very difficult because you yourself don't invest your perspective on it then why should the audience right uh, do you think it would not have worked uh, if he was not broke at that time in life i i think i don't think he was i don't think he was broke at that exact moment in his life but i think he has written that bit when he was, when he was facing it because the observations seem pretty pretty on point so it comes from a fact that he has experienced something so once you experience something you will have a unique perspective on it because you've experienced it like if he speaks about his divorce that's because he's had a divorce that is why he can refer to it if he's experienced this he will have sharp writing on it so basically they say that comedy comes from honesty and all these kinds of things uh, but i was seeing one uh, louis ck interview where he said that ki everything you hear me do a bit about where a stranger is saying something to me that's never happened i i only made it up yeah uh, so basically the whole thing about ki is he manufacturing his honesty or is it actually coming from an honest place so like do you manufacture your honesty or is it actually honest like how much of it is manufacturing it and how much of it is just fake i don't think you must think of it as fake like louis ck is in a certain bit saying that this thing it never happened someone told me it's always me mm. telling someone the fact that he's honest about that that means that bit is honest mm. so there is no dishonesty <coughs> so i feel honesty will work but if you are able to paint a picture well enough that will work also so you don't have to experience it if you have experienced it you will have a unique perspective but if someone else has experienced it and you were there or you can mentally be there thinking of how it would have happened it would still make the audience laugh hard enough 
So I think questioning the premise, whether it's true or untrue, is a disservice to comedy. Never question the premise, never question if it ever happened or not. Yeah. So, so are you saying honesty is not to be confused with experiential stuff, right? Yeah. Honesty could be of perspective, but not experienced. Yeah. I mean, asking anyone, oh, did that really happen? Is killing the idea of anything happening. So I have never met a comedian who has come after my show, given me feedback of the show and asked me, hey, that old man on the flight, what exactly did he say? It's not important. What did you laugh on? That is what he said. It's like when you shoot a film and the character is making tea. Now tea takes eight minutes to make. Now you have just two minutes in the film for the guy to have tea also. <laughs> so is it dishonest? It's something to think about. The dishonesty is when you pretend to be someone else. That is dishonesty. So by far we saw all the comedians are like good writers. Can someone pull a good set just by performance? Not a comedian. Not a comedian? I don't think so. Like how I'm yet to be surprised writing? if it's possible, maybe. I don't know. But I think there has to be good writing. Okay. Without writing, how much can you perform? What will you perform? Like, what is the percentage? Like, for example, if 70% writing, 30% performance? I don't think you can divide it in percentages. It's two personalities. We think in statistics. And we think every time we go out that we, there'll be a chart and this much will be topicality, this much will be and that much. It's not like that actually. It's totally dependent on your personality. I can't say that 70, what is 70% performance and 30% writing? I don't know. How do you define 60% performance and 40% writing? Oh, and what is a good 50-50? Nobody knows. So I just feel that there are comedians who have the advantage of acting and they have stage experience and they are good actors. So they can do better selling of the joke. There's no denying that. But to sell a product, you have to have it. If you don't have the joke, then how much can you improvise? And how much can you perform? Yeah. Uh, just adding to his question, what I understood is meant to say is like, Crowd work shows are 100% performance and less comedy writing. No, that is, crowd work shows are not 100% performance and less comedy writing because how different is one show to another? How different, if the ticket price is the same, the class of people is coming the same, how would it be very different? You would mostly have similar audiences. How difficult would it be to find a lawyer, a divorcee, a married couple, a dating couple, a person who is working in Cisco, a person who is working at Baiju's, a person who loves the Indian cricket team. It's the same show. It's almost, uh, it is a different show because people say different things and the comedian reacts differently. But it's not something, it is something that audiences are impressed thoroughly by. But as a comedian, I am not because I know that you are not getting the applause for writing a great joke or doing a great premise or doing something timeless, doing something that will stand the time test of time, like these bits. You are getting the laugh because you are spontaneous. And that is an impulse that anyone who does com comedy more than five, six, seven, eight years, they can handle at least that much. It is easy. It is like if you have done bits and if you've written comedy bits that have worked, for you to do crowd work is like moving from uh, like a fully manual, pathetic car which has always problems to a fully automatic, smooth running, chauffeur driven car. Crowd work is easy after years of doing stand up. Thank you. So uh, I think we have finished our first segment, which is punchline and premises.
I started with saying premises and punchlines, but I end with saying punchline and premises because sometimes the punchline makes the premise more interesting, and sometimes a very interesting premise can take you through even not that strong a punchline. Both are very equally important and complementary to each other. So we will move to the next topic, which is related to self and what perspective can a person get to comedy. We will see other videos in the same format and then discuss it. मैं चाहता हूँ कि आप सिर्फ एक ही प्रार्थना में ध्यान लगाएं और वो है हंसी क्योंकि जब आप हंस रहे होते हैं तब आप प्रेजेंट मोमेंट में होते हैं आप फ्यूचर में जाकर नहीं हंस सकते और आप पास्ट में जाकर नहीं हंस सकते